looking at Hong Kong, thinking is that the prologue to their own future? Um, and I know that the United States um, Navy, uh, Indo-Pacific Command, and uh, and you mentioned earlier this week um, uh, the potential creation of a new naval force, which is very interesting. Yes. Um, but you know, this threat from China is something. I mean, we stand at Halifax. We do stand for something. Not every conference, every group does, and that is democracies. You know, we're not relativists. We don't think that democracies and dictatorships are somehow you know, different ways of looking at things. We are completely clear that democracies are, 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 democracy is a superior form of government from tyranny, which shouldn't be a difficult proposition to make, but it's amazing how many people will not act upon that premise. And so, I, so we have a proven track record of that, right? So all uh, uh, democratically oriented rule of law nations um, have, uh, since the end of World War II, uh, maintained, uh, you know, peaceful world, more or less. I mean, there have been regional conflicts, and the United States is coming out of one now. Uh, but all in all, it's because of those democracies mm. that we've had this incredible period of peace. Um, and that the belief in rule of law is one that will, you know, see us through living in a much uh, more uh, enjoyable world, a better state than we would if we were oppressed as the history of the world has shown us. So this is something that I hold near and dear to my heart. You know, I uh, prior to coming into this role was the U.S. ambassador in Norway. Right. And I'm a big NATOist. I believe that NATO is the greatest alliance formed between its partners uh, in the creation of mankind. Uh, certainly, it's proven the test of time in the last uh, 70 years. Mm. Um, but I think we should think beyond NATO today. I think we should look at a NATO that is an alliance of democracies around the world. Why couldn't we take that concept, Robin? and uh, use it to align all democratic peoples uh, from one part of the globe to the other. And when I think about that, you know, the United States Navy's interest in the Indo-Pacific, as you've indicated, is such that I would love to see Japan and Singapore and Indonesia and India and Australia, um, you know, as part of that greater NATO alliance. It's interesting, isn't it, um, uh, Mr. Secretary, that the um the administration, uh, there's a certain narrative out there that the administration is only interested in bilateralism. And yet one of the things in, in researching that very uh, handbook on China, uh, which I, I, I authored, uh, I spoke to people, um, in, uh, many, many people in Asia, whether it be in India, Japan, Taiwan, uh, and one of the most interesting renaissances in partnerships among democracies has been the Quad. Um, the, the partnership between the United States, India, Japan, and Australia. Australia yeah. and, and people hold that up as, a, as potentially a way to do alliances in the 21st century. It doesn't necessarily come with bells and whistles, uh, but it seems to work. I mean, how effective, in your opinion, is the Quad, and what is the secret to its success? Well, again, I think it aligns people around their beliefs and what they hold sacred, right? Um, you know, I am a firm believer that the... You know, people of the United States um, believe that, you know, democracy, it, democracy is something we almost take for granted. Um, and today, uh, there are nations around the world that recognize that that may not necessarily be the case. That, mm. uh, you know, some of the pressures that they've seen in different parts of the world, and especially in the part of the world that you just mentioned, um, has uh, required uh, nations uh, uh, to look towards one another differently. And that bond around the belief in rule of law um, and especially uh, as the Secretary of the Navy here, um, you know, in freedom of the seas, freedom of navigation, um, you know, is ever so important. And that's the reason why there is that type of emphasis. I think it, it's one of the things that, I mean, people who, who you work with, people who, who I work with, who, who are experts in the, in the field of, uh, of, of the military and talk about the Navy, but it's quite hard to actually explain to people that, very basic things in our lives that we take for granted mm -hmm. depend upon the Navy, and most particularly the United States Navy, keeping the waterways open. Because it isn't the natural state of affairs, is it? I mean, there's all sorts of things can go wrong from piracy on the one hand to, as we've seen in the East and South China Sea, um, non-democratic governments who, who want to throw their weight around. I mean, is that something that, that we need to be more aware of and need to be more vocal about to get the public to understand? just how important the rules-based order is and how important the, the Navy is in keeping that whole thing on the road. 
Absolutely. So I forget the figure, Robin, and I apologize. I should have brushed up on this before coming here, but I didn't think you're going to ask me these types of, uh, you know, uh, questions. Uh, but I think uh, it's either 70 or 80 percent of the population of the world lives uh, adjacent to the water within like yeah, 15 or 20 I miles. Um, and when you think of the importance of waterways, as you travel around the world, as I've traveled around the world, I mean, uh, they don't all benefit from the kind of highway system or rail system that we have in the United States or in the United Kingdom. So water factors prominently and uh, trade is, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the element that uh, keeps all of the nations of the world uh, linked together and allows us to, uh, um, to progress um, in a manner that's consistent with our self-interest. So trade, freedom of navigation, and open sea lanes are you know, critical to the mm. success of the world, whether you're a small trading partner or you're a major trading partner. Um, and the only force that exists that has proven its record to keep those sea lanes open is the United States Navy. Um, and we have no interest other than to ensure freedom of the seas. That's a very good segue into the question of China, isn't it? Because one of the one of the great differences between the threat posed by China and the threat that was posed by the Soviet Union is that the Soviet Union was not really integrated in the global economy. Yes, there was oil and gas uh, which came out of the Soviet Union, but nobody's department stores were stacked full of, of, of items from, you know, made in Magnitogorsk or made in Moscow or even or Petersburg. These were, this was a, essentially a bipolar world in which uh, the economies of the Soviet bloc were, were interconnected, but were not connected with the rest of the world. Right. With China, we have a different issue, don't we? Because we do. part of our own material prosperity depends on this global economy. And yet we see all around us, especially in the last few years, people have woken up to this threat to our democracies from China. This is a very assertive regime, isn't it? Well, China's played the game differently than Russia, for sure, from the Soviet Union. Um, and that is the one thing, uh, one element in the relationship which buoys my spirits, to be very honest with you, because I think that China is dependent on access to Western markets um, as we are um, currently dependent on having access um, you know, to what they produce for us. Um, and I think that uh, realization um, will help us all you know, maintain the peace. Um, but I also, I, I'm a big student of history. and. Uh, you know, I am a big navalist when it comes to that history. So George Marshall, um, uh, iconic figure in the history of the United States, uh, one of our first secretaries of defense um, and the secretary of state, uh, was awarded the uh, Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo in 1952. And when he received that award, he was asked, you know, how uh, do the Western allies assure victory in World War III? Uh, and he said, well, the only way that we assure victory in World War III is uh, to prevent it, right, through deterrence. And that's where the Navy is uh, so important as that deterrent force. I'm uh, interested to see how China has pivoted to the sea in the last 10 years. There's been an awakening, uh, awakening that uh, the PRC has seen that all great powers of the world um, have always been maritime nations. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, they seem to have embraced that Mahanian doctrine of turning to the seas. Um, prior to that, they had been pretty much a land-centric military. Well, they no longer are land-centric. Uh, as we speak today, they have more ships than any nation in the world. And, uh, you know, why? What is their interest? Well, their interest is to be able um, to ensure that uh, their goods uh, leave, uh, you know, their nation and are, uh, are transited uh, to all the other nations in the world. Um, but will that be, you know, in a free and open manner uh, as it has been um, you know, under the protectionism, if you will, mm. of the United States Navy. We uh, don't know that. That's a question that's uh, yet to be determined. Uh, that report, uh, I don't know whether you were referencing it directly, you would have, of course, known it anyway, that, uh, that came out, I think, in September, the Pentagon report, caused a certain amount of consternation, the, the, uh, the recognition that uh, China has 350 ships, which is more. Uh, 355 today. 355. Not that, that I'm keeping count. No, well, <laughs> I think somebody's got to keep That's count because uh, th these guys are, are, not, are not messing around, are they? I mean, it, it's quite possible that the quality is, is not as, as good as, you know, number. there isn't just numbers, there's also right. quality. And I'm sure the United States... Quality matters, but sometimes quantity has a quality all of its own, right? So, uh, right. Uh, but I would agree with you. I mean, uh, you know, our, our ships are uh, the most technologically advanced in the world. Mm. Uh, but you can't uh, hang your hat on that and, uh, you know, say, okay, well, we've got this problem solved. Um, 
you know, we need to continue to be vigilant. We need to continue to be um, oriented towards the sea. We are a maritime nation. And I grew up in Michigan, right, in the middle of the nation. Uh, mm. You know, arguably, sure, it's a, uh, a water-oriented state, but it isn't on one of the coasts. We are a maritime nation. We need a strong Navy to thrive and to continue to protect ourselves and provide, again, for uh, that rule of law that the world seems to you know, really desire. Everybody is very interested in coming to America. Well, why? Well, we have created here uh, the greatest uh, form of government uh, built off uh, you know, many of the other democratic models that have existed around the world. But uh, again, we're... Um, we're proud of that. We need to protect it. And as you say, it needs protecting. And if everyone says that vigilance is the price we pay for our democracies. And you, uh, a little earlier this week, you did uh, make an announcement that uh, drew a lot of attention of the, the possibility of a new U.S. Uh, first fleet or a new numbered fleet uh, in the Indian Ocean or in the Indo-Pacific. I wonder if you could expand a little, <laughs> first of all, on what you had in mind and, and, uh, and, and how likely this is to transpire. Well, I think it's very likely to transpire. Um, you know, the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region is very vast. And today, uh, we maintain a presence out of Japan uh, under the auspices of the Seventh Fleet. Um, you know, and as I think to the future, uh, and I look at what the potential threats are, as well as to reassure our allies and partners, um, I think it would be very wise to uh, position a new numbered fleet somewhere towards uh, the uh, western southern borders of the Pacific Ocean, mm. where we could also pivot to the Indian Ocean. Um, you know, um, you had uh, talked about uh, uh, relationship to India, relationship to Australia. I mean, all important uh, aligned, democratically oriented partners of ours. Um, you know, I was, have to say, uh, misquoted uh, a little bit in this. I talked about positioning it. Uh, my vision is more of it being an expeditionary uh, numbered fleet. I mean, historically, uh, the United States Navy has operated its numbered fleets at sea uh, under the command mm -hmm. of a sea-going uh, uh, flag officer. Um, we still maintain some of that capability. Uh, we have a command ship in Japan that is actually the flagship of the Seventh Fleet. Um, and I think uh, to be relevant in that part of the world, um, you know, having that kind of mobility would be very uh, important. Uh, so we're looking at a number of different uh, options as to how we would position ourselves um, in that uh, very important and very influential uh, region of the world. And would it be fair to say that this is, this is all coming about because of the way we have to rethink our strategic position vis-a-vis -vis that assertive uh, China that is, is a reality we it, have to take account it, of? It, it absolutely is. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, but again, you know, when I have uh, had discussions uh, with individuals either here in the United States, in Europe, or in the Far East, you know, everybody is concerned um, about, uh, you know, that aggressive behavior that uh, uh, the PLAN has, uh, has exhibited. So, um, you know, Again, the United States is not looking for any type of confrontation. We are a freedom-loving people. Uh, but we want to make sure that those nations that align with our beliefs recognize that we are willing to protect their interests as well as our own. And that is through uh, freedom of navigation. I wonder what you think about the proposition. It's one of the things I, I raise, but I don't want to be uh, uh, presumptuous enough to answer. The, the possibility that Xi Jinping has, has, has stepped too far that he miscalculated. Authoritarian regimes have a history of underestimating democracies, and they take division and discussion that we take for granted. Sometimes we think we go too far, but by and large, pluralism as a sign of weakness. And in fact, it seems that certainly in 2020, a lot of the world, the, the parts of the world that were asleep have now woken up. Uh, the United States, which was actually the first major country to really get to grips with, uh, with China and to push back, um, is taking a lead on this. Um, do you get the impression that Xi Jinping might be getting more than he bargained for? Because you put all these democracies together, that is a huge force to push back against China with, isn't it? Well, it's the right thing to do, right? Um, it's the only way that we counter um, you know, what their intent may be. We don't know what their intent is. Um, and you know, I've heard that debate many times. Um, you know, we know that uh, the recognition of what China's interests are 
um, you know, may lead them in a direction uh, that would be counterproductive uh, to rule of law. And I think, again, going back to what I said, if we ensure that we are all, the rest of uh, those freedom-loving, uh, you know, rule of law-oriented nations stand together, you know, we will ensure that China has to deal with us appropriately mm. on an evil, even playing field, um, you know, rather than dominate any one sector segment of the globe. Um, so I don't know the answer to your question uh, straight up. Um, I'd like to think that, uh, you know, we could have been a little more aware a little earlier on. I think uh, we had our attention misdirected towards, you know, a different part of the world. Um, you know, thankfully, uh, as you said, we've, uh, you know, recognized what the challenge is. We've pivoted it appropriately. For us, uh, the national defense strategy, uh, you mm -hmm. know, is kind of a, it, well, not kind of, it is our guide star. And uh, we are about to uh, release between the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, a tri-service maritime strategy that will align our maritime forces uh, to the NDS. Um, we've had a lot of irons in the fire over the last six months. Um, I arrived in the Navy Department here uh, back in the springtime and we've had our head down focused on uh, what we need to strategically create to meet that threat of uh, emerging threat uh, mm. of the future. And so we don't only want to build but we have to pay for those ships. So uh, as a former businessman uh, mm. we sharpened our pencils and we went to work. Um, and instead of doing something uh, that I think is a logic of going through every single line item in the Department of the Navy's budget, um, I asked our folks to focus specifically on the areas of largest return. And so we were able to find uh, about $47, $48 billion over the next four to five years that will help mm. us pay for what that fleet is. But that work that was required internally before we could go externally with that um, has taken up the uh, you know, the days and weeks uh, prior to some of the announcements that you're going to hear mm. coming out now, including what you asked me about First Fleet. We've got some more announcements, the Tri-Service Maritime uh, Strategy. We have a new Naval Arctic Strategy coming out. All these things will be released in the next few weeks. Uh, it sounds Christmas gifts. Christmas gifts. Well, to I the mean United <laughs> States and the people of the world. Well, that is a wonderful gift to the world. As a final question, it, it is perhaps the most uh, frightening uh, prospect um, that's, that is raised by the whole China question, and that is Taiwan. Um, right now, um, we see what's going in Hong Kong with the evisceration of, of the one country, two systems arrangement. Um, Indo-Pacific Command is very formidable, um, arguably the most p formidable single military organization on the planet. Can you defend Taiwan, ultimately? I believe we can. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I know, I served 31 years in the United States Navy. I had the uh, great fortune of having uh, uh, worked many times in a joint environment. I worked for General Mattis when he was the mm -hmm. Joint Forces Command uh, Commander. Um, and we have an extremely capable military that becomes uh, even more capable each and every day. And I think, uh, going back to your question, um, you know, of looking to the future and understanding what those threats are, uh, pivoting towards that, uh, following the NDS and the work that's gone on in the last four years, yeah, I, I think uh, we could, we would um, be prepared to do just that. We can I never underestimate the United States of America. There have been many nations that have, and you may look to you know, some of the divisiveness domestically, but when somebody takes a shot external to this nation, we come together, bond together. The strongest word in the title of our nation is United States of America. And I hope there isn't any nation ever, including the People's Republic of China, that underestimates that commitment. Let's hope they don't. Um, Secretary Braithwaite, thank you so much for being with us at HFX 2020. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Robin, very much. Thank you. And great to meet a fellow Yorkshireman. <laughs> <laughs> um, Absolutely.